Look at those guys. Full of excitement, sentimentality, hope. <laughs> Sheer ignorance. They think it's a tiny car. We'll just buff it and fix some rust. How cute is that? Clearly the car had other ideas, which over the next nine years would turn into a full custom frame, an all new powertrain. And now with just the sheet metal being left, it's safe to say that nothing about it was suitable for 400 horsepower. Nothing put back in it has been a typical solution. Nothing about our tools or workspace are winning an award, and nothing will change the fact that I've fallen head over heels in love with the thing. Having left off the previous episode with a freshly reworked dash and firewall, this time we're going to start putting new parts back in. And how hard can that be? You know, voiceover guy, whenever you say that, things always get annoyingly complicated. And I'm the one doing the work. Well, good luck with that. In order to fit our selection of modern non-inconveniences to the car then, we've had to tackle some other chores first. Starting with the MX-5 seats, which gave us our driving position, and now the tubular framing, which has added strength, protection, and will let us attach parts to it. Think of it as the beginnings of a quasi-roll cage. Though the car is not actually getting caged. Regardless, someone mentioned that we should have left the whole space open until we had a better idea of where the new parts will live. Yeah. Thanks. We already spent weeks mocking things up off camera as none of it was very entertaining and each item will be dealt with on its own anyway. At this point I'd say something like, a lot gets cut in an effort to rush these videos out for you, but that joke's been done before. So let's get things rolling today by locating the least flexible part of the package, the steering. Now we explained previously why we want power steering, so I'm not going into that again, and we mentioned that hydraulic assist wasn't really possible in the space we have to play with. So rather than spend the big bucks for an EPS kit, we naturally chose the DIY method, using a $65 column from a Chevy Equinox and an $80 controller to make everything function like factory. Sounding good to me so far then. We only got as far as quickly zip tying the column in place last time though, and although you can get the idea that we've got some room for repositioning, where it's aiming, eh, not so much. Usually with a longitudinal engine, the steering shaft, or the part that connects the column and the rack, snakes beside or underneath the engine, and that usually includes the exhaust, intake, or accessories. We don't have this luxury. The LS may be surprisingly compact for a 5.3 liter V8 motor, but nevertheless, if we're going to have any chance to make the steering functional, the shaft will have to snake between the block and the exhaust manifold. A bit of a squeeze and not exactly normal then, but at this point, normal just sounds boring. So there's that. However, not only does the shaft have to snake through here cleanly, it also has to avoid the future clutch, brake, and throttle pedals while not getting in the way of our toes. As kindly pointed out, without actually mounting any of those things, we only have estimates to work from, of course, but we've got to start somewhere. So let's begin with the attachment of the GM and Triumph parts. In an effort to perfect the steering geometry back in episode 18, the rack was heavily narrowed. So much, in fact, that there's no clear path from the spline to the column anymore, and that's not really helpful. To combat this, we decided to add a double universal joint to snake things out past the oil pan. So now it's still tight, but actually possible. And we mentioned that due to the inherent design of a double universal, we'd also need a support bearing to prevent it from flapping around in the breeze. So we grabbed this little heim joint that the shaft can ride in. This is the factory lower shaft, and along with the upper shaft and retaining clamp, this is what connected everything originally. Where the two join is an integrated collapsible section to mitigate the chance of this otherwise giant metal spear impaling you, rather uncomfortably, in a collision, which is a useful feature. Below all of that, though, is the modernized, unified, compact version of the same setup from, you guessed it, a 2006 Equinox like our column hails from. All we've got to do then is merge these and this. For those of us who are saying you're hacking up a 50 whatever year old part, it actually has a massive wobble in it. And what we need is this end. So we're just going to cut that off. Last piece. It has the splines that we need on this end and it's exactly perfect to everything else. It's just too long. The collapsible section had to be shortened for fitment, but it still functions the same as always, and the new UV will fit in the end to align the two for welding. 
So this is the poor men's lathe. We got to take that shaft down to this diameter. I was planning on actually drilling out the center of the tube that this shaft slides into, but it was going to make the wall thickness just a little too thin that I, I, I didn't trust it. So instead we're going to turn this down. It's a 32nd of an inch radius that I got to take off here. And pretty much the only thing I can think of right now is flap wheel on there. Yeah, I don't have any other options at this point, so let's just give it a shot and see how it goes. That's how it normally works. Yeah, so if any lathe manufacturers are watching, <laughs> I don't know where we put it. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, I think we figured that if out. If they'd like to donate a lathe and a double car garage. Yeah. <laughs> Where we've arrived is this dimension here is just a hair loose on the on the end of it and it's reasonably tight up at the end. So it's a little bit of a taper almost and if it was a taper that was an actual interference fit that would be great, but I turned it down a little bit too far. <laughs> However, that's as good as we're gonna get. So we're just gonna have to cut the end off. It's gonna be that short. Then we can trim down the little bit that I've already tried cutting on the end. We did cut this long, but that should slip inside and, and we can go from there. But okay. that, there you go. That's, that's not what I was planning on doing, but I think it'll work. Yeah. So with the adjustments taken care of, what should happen now is this. Perfect. For those concerned about welding steering components. That's precisely how this shaft was assembled from factory. So, not concerned. It's just getting tacked here as I want to pull all the bearings out to properly burn it in place later, but this at least lets us check that everything is the right length before committing. Oh, and just a tip, always make sure your welding gas is turned on. Did I turn on the gas? No, I didn't. We'll fix that later. Turning our attention to the heim joint then, it's a bit long right out of the box, and there's no way we're going to make it fit. But with judicious use of the anvil grinder, trimming it down is no big deal. Same goes for the adapter. And with it just resting in place, we can finally connect everything to see what we've got. So for the first time since we had the car on the old chassis, we have a wheel connected to a thing, connected to another thing, turning our wheels. That's fairly tight. Now, the steering column is held in by zip ties. <laughs> so here, just hold up. That should be a little bit more solid for you. So what we're working on down here then, we got our heim joint there, which the shaft's coming down and through, going into the U-joint, going into the rack. And our clearance from the U-joint to the oil pan is next to zero. But where that little guy gets welded in is key to keep the clearance where we need it. So that is literally our next step here is to figure out where to weld that in. But that's not bad. It's not bad at all. And that's a decent amount of turning radius, I'd say. Turning angle. It's not a drift car. This is all coming back to Ackerman, where the inside tire has to turn sharper to follow the same overall radius that the, you know, the inside tire is shorter distance than the outside tire. So yeah. this one turns more. So this, this is the, this is the aggressive part. Yeah, this is why you write a script and then you don't have this blabbering and then <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> yeah, so at this point, we can just go ahead and mount the column and weld in the heim joint, right? Wrong. I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of clearances we need to keep in mind. And the main area we got to focus on right now is space for our feet and pedals. For which we need pedals. So we've mocked up a couple. We're going to skim right through this as the entire setup is our subject for next time. But right now, you can see that when we try to move from throttle to brake, we're getting hung up on the steering linkage and potentially even the column itself. Not good. Braking should be the least complicated task when driving a car. Now, we could wind back time and put on smaller shoes to prevent our feet from growing, but I'm months away from cracking time travel. So the next most obvious yet duller way to solve this conundrum is to move the column higher. Unfortunately, we can't do that because some dodo just put a dash bar in the way. Classic. Can already hear the comments about planning ahead again, so at this point I've got to say that we did foresee this as being a potential issue, but the height of the bar was chosen to allow other parts to fit and to have it align with the door hinges for strength. There's always more going on than just the task at hand. Regardless, it's no use to us like this, so I guess we'll settle for a bump of some kind. Like that. 
Moving the piece of tubing at least one and a half inches out of the way should solve our problem. As a matter of fact, we're going to move it up and rearward to maintain the clearances we need, while also helping to put our arms at a slightly more comfortable angle. So with some checking, diagramming, and more checking, we should be good to go. Let's get on with it. With a dash bar clamped against a piece of angle iron to keep things straight, we've got pretty decent fit up, and we feel confident to tack the new relief in place. Just using tacks for now, as always, means if we need to pull it apart later, it's no big deal. So other than that one tack that got a bit too toasty, the patient has pulled through the alteration very well. And having learned our lesson from episode 33, the cardboard template worked a treat to make sure the angles were right. First try. CAD for the win. Now we can get on with attaching the steering column, and there's some interesting features to account for. The front of the column hangs off one long horizontal bolt, and the end closest to the driver uses this rather awkward hanger with mounting holes located vertically. It's shaped like this because the column itself is designed to collapse in an accident, which may explain why we weren't too concerned about reducing the length of the collapsible section in the shaft earlier. But in order for the column to crush down, the mounting locations here need to break away, and that's what these little tabs are about. Something to keep in mind in all this is we're actually mounting the entire column upside down compared to the factory GM setup. And while this won't affect the operation, it does change the attachment slightly. Mainly, we need to be careful to ensure we can still get it in and out of the car. Thankfully, with yet another CAD template in place, we should be able to incorporate all the features cleanly. So you know what comes next.
So we've got a couple of uh, C-clamps holding this up nice and tight now. We've actually been able to set sort of the angle of the wheel and the clamps are strong enough to even hold it where we want. So where I am, I've got a fist clearance to my knee. I've got a nice bit of bend to my arms. Like it's, it's pretty much exactly where I would put the wheel if I had the ability to put it anywhere I wanted, which we kind of had, but kind of not, considering where the steering linkage has to stake down past the engine. It, it sort of had to be here, but this feels good. And when I look forward, the top of the rim, at least for me, Dad actually is uh, just a hair shorter, but the top of the rim is slightly below the edge of the hood, and for Dad it was almost exactly spot on. So the rim's not creating any kind of blind spot whatsoever. All, the only thing down there is round. And although this is really short, that's just what these cars are. And of course, there's going to be a rubber seal that takes up even more height, so we're, we're losing another half an inch or so. <laughs> if, if we put in the factory style. Yeah, but that's our visual range. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't see anything higher than the top of Dad's head right now, and you're just standing at the end of the hood, so <laughs> it's <laughs> not ideal. But this is great. I have good foot room, which was the main reason why we went through all the hassle of creating this bump out. These little brackets have turned out beautifully. I'm really, really pleased with those. And honestly, what we're ready to do now is, is put some tacks on here so we can take the clamps out, take the zip ties out, and the steering column is mounted. That is a mounted steering column. Set it. From an Equinox. <laughs> Power steering, baby. It's good. Nobody really ever thought they needed power steering in a GT6 because they're so light, but uh, with all the different geometry and a smaller wheel, I think it'll be nice. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, awesome. And we case. are removing zip ties and the steering column is staying put. That is an Equinox steering, holy smokes, it doesn't wiggle. It doesn't wiggle. <laughs> it's not supposed to. This bolt here, if I back it off, That's right, people. We have a tilt column, and I believe not even Project Binky kept that feature. <laughs> Sorry, did I just so go did, there? Yeah. Did, did I just go did, there? You did go there. <laughs> tilt column. Okay, it's not much, but you know what? That makes a difference when you're inside the car. If you're trying to find the optimal hand position, that makes a difference. Well, that's a major milestone. Five years ago, when we started down the Resto Mod path, I had some idea how this would come together, but I never imagined the work involved being quite so in depth. Having it all fitting together and working now though, I tell you, it feels freaking amazing. The wheel's position has been improved and it's very comfortable in here now. The fact that we'll have some degree of tilt is just hilarious, and the brackets holding it on are as minimalist as I could hope for while still being very sturdy. I had thought about some additional gussets, but honestly, it doesn't need them. Of course, life can't always be simple though, as like a few of you will have noticed by now, a byproduct of moving the column towards the driver is that the adapter we made earlier yeah, it's too short. Well, at least we tacked it together. Let's look on the bright side. This is actually a good thing, as once corrected, we'll have slightly more crush added back in, which, along with the collapsible column and the U-joints, means we have a far safer steering system compared to factory. Who would have thought technology advanced over the last half century? Thankfully, all the rest of the clearances up here haven't really changed with the new column position, so let's just redo the adapter and make it extend a bit further. Just the affixing of the new heim joint then. This thing is almost out as extension, but just enough to lift it off the Jenga blocks. Right there is where this little thread sticking out the side of the UV joint comes quite close. It's still clearing though. So you just gotta make sure that everything's good here and then we can tuck it. 
Somewhat predictably, I can't really fit in here to weld it fully. And seeing as my engine hoist decided to leak out all its oil a year ago, and I can't be bothered to fix it just now, tax will do. Yet even with just two, like everything else, it's already feeling incredibly solid. I am really very happy with the results. The location of the wheel is near perfect. The shaft clears the engine with no trimming of anything. And although it's obviously tight, putting the clamp as far forward as we could brings it nicely away from our feet. It may even live outside the firewall eventually. So although carpet and sound deadening may not allow clearance for work boots eventually, that wasn't actually a requirement for me, and we should be very comfortable with runners on. All in all then, great stuff. Now what's next was, uh, no, that's not it. Ah, that's what, <laughs> that's the side. We have to find room for. So then, on to the brakes, next time. Thanks to all our amazing subscribers for watching and sharing this video, and a very special thanks to the patrons and donators who tangibly support our shenanigans. If you're interested in helping out, there are links in the description below. Keep building, and we'll catch you next time.